Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jen White, host of 1A on NPR. On January 6th, we watched as a mob attacked the Capitol in Washington, D.C. in an attempt to overturn the 2020 election. They defaced the halls of Congress, chanted threats aimed at members of Congress and Vice President Mike Pence. Some were armed. They were motivated by the lie repeated by then President Trump that the election had been stolen. Five people died that day, including one of the rioters who was shot by Capitol Police. More than 1,200 people have been charged with federal crimes in the intervening years. Hundreds have been found guilty. This wasn't an attack by foreign actors. It was an attack on the U.S. by Americans. They're our coworkers, our neighbors, at times our family members. According to the National Institute of Justice, quote, the number of far-right attacks continues to outpace all other types of terrorism and domestic violent extremism. Who are these people? What motivates them and how do we disrupt extremist violence before it erupts? And what are the stakes for all of us if we don't? With us today is journalist and documentarian Alexandra Pelosi. Her most recent documentary for HBO is The Insurrectionist Next Door. Also with us, Vidya Ramalingam. She's the founder and CEO of Moonshot. That's a company working with people becoming radicalized online to de-escalate them from violence. Vidya, let's just start with some data. Who's most at risk of falling into extremism? Well, I think we need to be careful not to be led by our assumptions. I think if you would ask almost anyone in this crowd, the assumption might be we're dealing with a problem that is largely young men. As I look at the data online around who is engaging with hate content, with content that incites violence against communities, against violence against our government, actually the picture is a little more complex. So about 75% of the audience consuming hate content online identify as male. That's still 25% that identify as, as female, so that's not a negligible amount. When I look at the age range of people that are consuming this content, roughly 50% of that audience sits between the ages of 18 and 35. Now again, that might seem like a lot, but think about that other 50%. And when I look at that other 50% over the age of 35, they're not clustered in the, in the 30s range. There's an even spread between 35 all the way up to 65 plus. So we are not just dealing with a problem that is about young men here. Yes, when I look at the perpetrators of mass violence in America, it is overwhelmingly men who are perpetrating those attacks. But as I look online at the, the community that is engaging, posting, um, pushing these narratives, the picture is a little more complicated. And we need to remember that as we conceive of solutions. Yeah. Alexander, for your documentary, you travel across the country interviewing people who've been charged in connection to the January 6th riot. What did you learn about who, who these people are and what motivated them? First of all, I want to say we can't paint them all with the same brush. It's very important to know that on January 6th, the leader of the Proud Boys, who went to jail for conspiracy and obstruction of justice and all that, texted to all his brothers Today, we're going to get the normies to burn this city to ash. So I was looking at the normies. Who are these normal people with jobs, families, lives that went to the Capitol that day? I don't think they went for an insurrection. I think this is a, you know, heat of the moment, crowd, things, strange things happen when people get in crowds. And the people that I met with were all people who took pleas for what they did, they admitted they did it, for five and a half years to six months. And I found what I made was a mosaic of broken America. It was a collection of people that were broken for all kinds of reasons. Not having an education was a big one. Uh, loneliness, COVID you know, lockdowns, they didn't have a lot of connection to the outside world. And Trump gave them a meaning, a belonging, I don't want to go with the whole cult thing, but it was a little, a little culty. And so I think that the portrait that I was trying to show was that they're not bad people. They just have a different social media feed than we do. And they get a toxic diet of misinformation. And they live in a completely different 
universe than we do. I made this film and it aired. And one of the gentlemen who went to jail and participated in the film, after he watched the film, he called me, gay gentleman who voted for Obama, but then somehow got wrapped into the whole Trump thing, called me and he said, my husband had never seen the violence. You know that, those images you've all seen on C-SPAN of like, oh, they were throwing things at cops and he'd never seen that footage. How could you live in America in 2024 and have never seen images of the Capitol that day? And he said genuinely they'd never seen that footage. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why I find that interesting is because I was inside the Capitol with my mother that day and my husband was outside the Capitol because he's a Dutch television correspondent. He was going live on Dutch television. And the QAnon shaman walked by and he would, had him on TV. And there was a certain Woodstocky, festivaly, NASCAR-y thing going on outside if you were on the other side of the Capitol. So there's a reason why from the speaker's office when we looked outside and we saw the full chaos, it looked like domestic terrorism. But if you were on the side my husband was on, it looked like a protest that went a little too far. But if you watch MSNBC, they're all painted as domestic terrorists. And if you watch Fox News, they're all painted as tourists. And the point is that you have to look at every single person individually, what crime did they commit, and how much time did they serve, because the government has gone through, and the government's given a lot of people house arrest, probation. Mm -hmm. So they're not all one kind of person. Mm -hmm. When we think about how people end up in extremist groups or perpetuating violence, Vidya, is there an identifiable pipeline to that? What strikes me uh, as fascinating when I met Alexandra and also when I watched her documentary is just how similar so many of the stories of the people she met with uh, were to people that I had met with 15 years ago. So my, my entry, my, my career has been in counterterrorism. I got into this world, I never thought I would have a career in counterterrorism, but about 15 years ago, I decided that I wanted to actually meet with white nationalists and have conversations with them, understand their journey into that, that ideology and that worldview. And it was, I, I could go on for hours telling you about that very bizarre experience in my life, but for me it was transformative in part because I think I went into it thinking these people are, are monsters, I'm never gonna understand them. And as I actually started to have conversations with people, did life history interviews with them, understood their entire um, life stories, first of all what struck me was just how familiar so many of their emotions were and also that it didn't feel entirely irrational. And that's, I think, what surprised me the most was I started to realize, okay, if you had had these experiences throughout your life, and if you felt this way as a result of those experiences, I could understand that if somebody came with this really simplistic solution for you that points a finger at the enemy and, and also makes it very clear who are the, who's evil, who's good, who are the heroes, who are the villains, I can understand how you might end up in this worldview. Now, the other thing that struck me at that time was there wasn't just one journey into hate. I, I imagined that there would be a kind of single through line that, that um, would, would kind of explain what takes someone in down that path. There were very different journeys. There were people who had PhDs that had ended up in hate groups. There were people who had been homeless who ended up in hate groups. So very, very different experiences. But if I had to distill it down to one common thread, I think for me it came down to every single person I have met with throughout my career who has been involved in an extremist movement. And by the way, this is not just about domestic terrorism, neo-Nazis, far-right groups, but it's also about Salafi jihadism and other forms of extremism. The commonality is a desire to be a part of something that is greater than oneself and the desire to, to feel like you belong to something that is greater than oneself. And, and that's what, you know, Alexander just said, that, that sense of belonging, um, and maybe even driven by a sense of loneliness. Um, now, the good news for us is, throughout my career, one of the, the kind of common points and common threads throughout my career has been, the ideology is actually just the tip of the iceberg. And what I mean by that is, the ideology might seem like it's the most important thing, and that's what people are latching on to, that's what they believe in, that's why they're there. But ultimately, if you scratch below the surface, you realize that it's really about a whole set of underlying drivers that are pushing people towards that ideology. And by underlying drivers, what I mean by that is maybe an experience of trauma in their past, maybe an experience of violence in their past even. 
maybe an experience of a broken family, something that has led them desiring a community or a sense of belonging. Maybe it's that they're grappling with feelings of um, being left behind, not understanding and, and not being able to cope with how society is changing around them. Um, but ultimately, those underlying drivers are what push people towards an ideology. And the good news for us is, if you want to get someone out of one of these movements, you don't necessarily need to debate them on the ideology. In fact, I would recommend you don't debate them on the ideology. As much as that is satisfying to people like us, unfortunately, the facts don't matter to people who are going down this path. But if you can get at the underlying drivers, usually the ideology just falls away. And so that's going to be the key to us actually solving this problem for America. I think this is a really good moment to go to a clip from your documentary, Alexandra. And this is you in conversation with a young man named Marquez. Why do you call yourself a conservative? Because I believe conservatives believe more in the family structure than the liberals do. That is such bullshit. I hate when conservatives belittle liberals by saying, you guys don't have family values. I get it. I got a house and kids and a mortgage and everything else. I have only been married once, happily, for decades. And your patron saint of your conservative movement, how many times has he been married? More than once. And he likes to grab women by the thing. Yeah, thing. Thank you. Do you feel like you were a little brainwashed by President Trump? Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that would be fair to say. Most people that went to January 6th were because they were stupid and bought the lie that Trump was pushing. I'd just like to point out that usually I went to everyone's house by myself. With a handheld camera, that's how I roll. But on this one, my husband looked at the guy on the internet. And he's like, I'm going to come with you because I don't like. So there's a second camera there because it's my husband. And when we left, he said, if I hadn't been there, you would have ended up in a vat of acid in his backyard. He did have a vat of acid in his backyard. Mm. So I, just context. Yeah. But, but what's interesting about Marquez is your, your conversation with him starts with him talking about his feelings of isolation not being in relationship with someone, not having a family, and his deep desire to have that. What did you learn about him through, through the time you spent in conversation with him about what led him to that day? Well, going back to the point broken, the word broken, every single Jan Sixer has the one word you could use for all of the ones I met and talked to was broken, which goes back to what you're saying. Now, I was just doing what you told them not to do. Don't confront them about the idea. That was not a good example. We shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but the point was that I was trying to confront him. And when he did say, oh, yeah, I do feel brainwashed, every single person that I talk to, who do you think they're supporting this November? So no matter what they said to me just to get, you know, try and get me out of their house, tell me what I wanted to hear, we have an election coming. Mm. And these people, like, you can't even say these people, that sounds like deplorables. They're Americans, they're citizens, and they're voting. And that's why we have to talk to them, which goes back to the work that you do, which is we can't just bury our head in the sand and say, they're all mentally ill, a lot of them are. They're, they don't have an education, a lot of them don't. Uh, you can't just dismiss them. We have to engage with them. And the mistake we're making, I feel, is like, remember when Donald Trump was convicted in a court? Did nothing. People were saying, I, I, I go to Trump rallies for a living. Unfortunately, that's my lot in life. And I just went to one last week, and they're just, they don't seem to care. So we seem to think that we have these, this is how you talk to people, right? You, logic, common sense doesn't work. There has to be, that's why we're looking to you to give us more kind of concrete, right. how do you talk to your Trump uncle, right? Well, NVIDIA, yeah. that, that raises the question about whose work this is. Mm. Because from an interpersonal standpoint, a lot of us don't have the skills <laughs> or the techniques at our disposal to know how to go about these conversations in a way that is productive and safe. So whose work is this? Okay, this is a big question, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through this. So the tech companies, everybody wants to point their finger at the social media companies, right? They're obviously to blame for the scale of hate and incitement to violence, and you know they've been responsible for genocides abroad and also what's happening here. Now, yes, the tech companies do hold some responsibility, and they certainly need to invest far more than they do now in content moderation. But what I would encourage you all to remember is 
we can't just moderate this problem away. Even if we had the best content moderation in the world on social media, first of all, these groups know how to walk the line online. They will use coded language. They won't use the, the racial slurs and the terminology we're all familiar with, which will get them you know, taken off the platform. No, they use coded language. So that, that you know, moderation isn't always going to solve that problem. Secondly, there are so many spaces on the internet where this content can thrive, which won't be liable to moderation. And I don't just mean fringe platforms or blogs. I also I mean. Think about emails and direct messages and the spaces online where you're not going to be moderated. But then the third point here is, yes, you can delete the comment, the post, um, the video. That comment is then deleted. That user is deleted. But the person isn't deleted, right? That person still exists in our community, and they may still pose a threat to us. So if we're really going to get at this problem, we have to get at the people that sit at the heart of, the, of this. Now, I want to separate this out. I'm going to come to the, you know, yeah. your uncle who's buying into conspiracy theories. But I, I want to be really clear that when it comes to prevention of terrorism, prevention of targeted violence, that is the responsibility of the United States government, of the federal government, and state governments. And, and feder the federal government and, and state governments do invest in programs that will actually intervene and attempt to actually de-escalate people from violence. Um, the sorts of methodologies that we know work, so I just mentioned earlier, um, we know that it's not about debating people on the ideology. You have to get at the underlying drivers. We do have a substantial evidence base that shows that the most effective way to get someone out of a hate group or out of that kind of ideology is to get them within the bounds of a one-to-one -one conversation with a trained specialist. And that trained specialist should usually be a social worker, a counselor, maybe a clinical psychologist if it's required, but really a practitioner who day in, day out deals with people who might be at risk of violence. These are people who already have the skills and the qualifications to deal with someone who might actually pose a threat. So the question for us is, OK, we know that works to get someone within the bounds of a one-to-one -one conversation where then they can get at the underlying drivers and work with this person to turn their lives around. The question is, how do we get that to scale? How do we get that across America to the thousands of people that are buying into conspiracy theories and, and considering violence? So what we've actually turned to is some really simple technology. It's the same technology that you all end up uh, experiencing day in, day out to get you to purchase more shoes, to get you to buy that handbag that you were thinking of. If you all, yeah, you all will, will know this. You, if you Google a pair of shoes, you're looking for that brand. You then get followed around by that pair of shoes on the internet for weeks after until you actually pick up your wallet and you pay for it. We've all done it, right? We, we all know that. Well, we're doing the exact same thing. If you are consuming hate content in America, if you are engaging with content that glorifies terrorism or glorifies the insurrection, what we are attempting to do is reach out to you through advertisements that you will then see and will follow you around in your online journey, which offer you the chance to speak to someone. And typically, the way that we interact with people is not to shake our finger at them and say, hey, you shouldn't be watching this content, or you, know, you might be an extremist. No, no. Our approach is, let's ask them questions. Let's ask them questions about their emotional state, around their feelings, their feelings of anger, maybe their feelings of loneliness. And we find the most effective question to actually start a conversation with someone who's going down this path is, are you feeling lonely? Or are you feeling isolated? Once again, you know, and, and knowing that so many of these people are coming from either broken families or backgrounds where they feel alienated and isolated. So that's what we're doing to actually get that to scale. But the crucial point there is that the trained practitioner at the other end of that, that line is someone who is qualified and skilled and knows how to deal with someone who might be violent. Now, that doesn't necessarily help you for you know, your uncle who's buying into conspiracy theories. And I think that is going to be an experience that is familiar to, I'm sure, many people in this room. Room. The scale of conspiracy theories, I mean, we're living in an era where the great replacement theory, which is an entirely false theory, uh, conspiracy theory, that claims that people of color are coming to the United States as part of a coordinated, orchestrated plan to uh, eliminate the white race. Now, entirely false conspiracy theory. We're living in an era where that conspiracy theory is being touted on network television. So we're in an era where I, I am certain almost everyone in this room will have someone in your life who might be buying into some of those conspiracy theories theories. And the thing you need to remember in that scenario is your power as a loved one of this individual. You have to remember that actually you hold the most power to be able to bring this person back. Now, I say that with a bit of caution, because you also have to ensure that you don't bear the burden alone, and that you don't take it on your own shoulders alone to change this person's path. Make sure that you are surrounded by a community who supports you and you can rely on. 
But as you're having conversations with that person in your life, again, I know it can be tempting to debate the facts, especially if you know that they are wrong. Don't do that. It's only going to back that person into a corner. My recommendation would be to listen. Listen to them first. Ask them questions. Ask them questions that get at their underlying emotional state, how they are feeling. And always ensure that you are providing that non-judgmental space for them. Um, you know, don't ridicule them. Don't shake your finger at them. And the reason why that is so important is they need the possibility to come back to you if and when they realize they were wrong. And I say this because as we were engaging with these audiences after the 2020 election, uh, if you all remember the QAnon conspiracy theories that were being shared quite widely, there were prophecies that were being shared about what was going to happen. Well, after the election in November, those prophecies were all proven false. None of them, none of them came to fruition. And so you had these communities of people online who actually were coming into online forums. These are QAnon supporters. And they were saying, they were writing on these forums, I don't know what to do. I, I alienated my whole family. My son won't speak to me. And the prophecies weren't true. And I don't have anywhere where I can go now. And we saw at that time a 20% increase in references to suicide on those spaces, those QAnon fringe platforms online. So it is so important for you to be a person that your loved one can come back to if and when they're ready. I don't want to let the mainstream media off the hook. I love everything yeah. you're saying. And, uh, but I want to make sure we make the point that we're in an age where you know the, media, the resources for the media are shrinking and they don't have the resources to go spend time in real America. You know, I went to the Iowa, New Hampshire, all that. And there's a certain element of you're standing in line with people waiting to go into a Trump rally. And then I won't name any sources here. I won't put anyone on the spot. But a reporter comes over and says, like, why do you love Trump? And then they say something racist. And then the journalist gets all, like, horny. It's like, clickbait, clickbait. And when I was in the Capitol on January 6th, I was with my teen, I have two teenage sons. And my 16-year-old said to me, why would you go? He did not like the fact that I was going to talk to these people for this film. And he said to me, it's like, you know, we're soccer, we're a soccer family. And there was a lot of streakers on the field in soccer. And at some point they stopped the, you know, I don't know if you know we're in the soccer season right now. And if you watch the game, they'll stop. If a streaker goes on the field, they will not put them on TV because there was a big explosion of streakers and everyone loved it when they were streaking. But it's sort of like Donald Trump. Why are we giving him all this negative attention? And it's because they need the clicks and we're horny for the clicks, but we're not, it's not responsible. Things that he says get repeated, and I am in the center of all this because I filmed all of January 6th, and I constantly get calls from the Associated Press, legitimate news organizations, and they'll say, well, Donald Trump said at his rally that you, and then they want to soundbite that that's going to give oxygen. They're giving oxygen to all the misinformation, and I'm trying not to single anyone out, but I could do a whole master class here, of, and so there is, you know this, there's a complete, they're all but, complicit but is, but is, is there a balance here, though, Alexander, because as a member of the media... Um, I intentionally uh, <laughs> did not go after NPR, but I did have a run-in with NPR at one of the... Oh, I won't... Go ahead. Well, well, the, well the question I have is this. This is, this is the, the challenge for, I think, anyone covering this election, and we take a very specific approach to it on our show in that we try to talk more about policy and the stakes of the election and not just, just the random things people say, but there's also value in paying attention to what people who will possibly serve as the next president of the United States to what they are saying, because how does that align with their, what they're saying they're going to do in terms of policy? Is it just hot air or is there an alignment that we actually need to pay attention to as citizens of the country? So where do you see that balance? Well, that's, I mean, that's a sort of a mathematical formula that you have to kind of make peace with, right? In each newsroom, they have to make peace with it. But I do see stories every day that I roll my eyes and think, this is the streaker. Here we are, just giving. So I don't know. I, I, 
Yeah, it's a, it's an art, it's a, not This a is a challenge. <laughs> yeah. And when, you, when you're watching for it more closely, you'll think, well, why are they printing this? Why are they reprinting mm -hmm. this sort of complete misinformation? I don't know. I don't have the answer. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm just a documentary filmmaker. I shove my <laughs> camera in people's faces. I don't have any answers. I'm just kind of... <laughs> but there know, are lots like of questions we should ask ourselves. Right. So, so, yeah. But it is a problem. Yeah. Obviously, we all know this is a problem. Mm -hmm. And as we, get up to the, as we lead up to the election, there's going to be this challenge. The crazier... The things that he says, well, you know, how do you I mean, fact check it, politifact it, check it? I don't know. I don't have the answer for it. Well, let's go to another clip from the documentary. This is you in conversation with a man named Johnny. I understand that there are questions about January 6th, but you can't accept the fact that the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers were planning something that day. I mean, three or four people can be, you know, I would say stupid like that, all right? But was the overall majority of the people there that day there to overthrow the government? No. There's no overthrowing a government with bullhorns and flags. Do you realize that the militant organizations that were there to overthrow the government needed a chorus of little people? They called them normies. People like you. They were just the fools. They were using you. Nobody used me. I went there on my own free will. Nobody come up and said, hey, Norm, Normie, we're gonna do this today. Nobody approached me trying to get me to do anything. I did stupid shit on my own, all right? You better not play this shit on TV, I swear. If you make me look like a fool, I'll be so pissed off at myself. <laughs> I'm not gonna make you look like a fool because I don't think I only that- make, I make myself look like a fool. So. I don't think that advances the conversation. No. We have to try to understand each other. Right. We have to listen to each other, and we have to try to understand each other. We can't make fun of each other. We can't, you know, hate each other. You called me a normie? <laughs> An insurrectionist? Huh? That's big words for somebody with a flag. A flag. How do I take over a government with a flag? How? It just don't happen. So this whole thing is a is, is uh, somebody's insurrection, not mine. He's in jail right now. He's still, he, yeah. he's still in jail right now. Some of these people are, you know, serving real legitimate long-term sentences and still defends Donald Trump to this day. There's a lot we could unpack about Johnny, <laughs> but I want to focus on what happens just after this part of your conversation when he tries to take you down the rabbit hole with, with him. He wants, he wants to lay out his, like this, this is what really happened. If you go with me, I can show you all of these things. And I think it's important because we can talk about this in, in the abstract and, and talk about, you know, it's just people letting off steam, people talking, it's just their perspective. But what does the data tell us, Vidya, about the, the connection between what's happening online and the likelihood that that will turn into violence? I think a lot of terms get used. You might have read in news articles the term keyboard warrior, the idea that it's just someone who's typing online. They're never going to do anything in person. You also hear the term lone wolf, which is used to describe maybe that person who's, you know, has their bedroom door locked and they're online. Well, I would argue the concept of a lone wolf probably is unlikely to exist in today's day and age. If you're online in your bedroom by yourself, you're not by yourself. You are with a community online that might be egging you on, encouraging violence. When we look at words online, threats of violence online, we see a direct correlation with offline violence. So we, we track threats against over 2,100 targets across the United States on a monthly basis. We ran a comparison of the latest available data from the FBI. So we looked at FBI hate crime st statistics. And apologies, because the data is from 2022. They have not yet released the 2023 data for us to look at. But when we look at 2022's FBI hate crime statistics, and we line it up side by side, we look at threats of violence online against black communities, threats of violence online against uh, LGBTQ plus communities, threats of violence online against a whole range of communities, and we look month by month at how that compares to the increases and decreases in hate crimes reported by the FBI against those communities, we see an almost eerie-like correlation between the two. You see almost the exact same percentage increase in threats of violence online against a, a targeted community as you do in, in direct violence 
violence that takes place offline against that community. So these are ju not just words online. What happens online matters. The two worlds, online, offline, IRL, in real world, they are fundamentally interlinked. And so we need to be worried about what we're seeing in the online space because it does have real world consequences. Alexandra, I, I have to ask you because I, it's something I think a lot of people grapple with. With the understanding that political violence is a real threat. You know that better than, <laughs> than many people. Um, David DePape attacked your father, seriously injured him, um, and, and, he, and he was found guilty on state charges just a few days ago, mm -hmm. federal charges last year. You have every reason to lean all the way out of this mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. Every reason, and no one would judge you, and yet, you lean in, and you encourage others to lean in. I want to know why. First, how is your father? <laughs> okay, how much time do we have? Okay, this is really hard to talk about because everything we're saying up here is interesting, but I've seen it. I've seen my father as Frankenstein in an ICU, and I've seen the actual consequence of what we're talking about. And this individual, you know, it's all public record. He went um, in the court and cried about how much he loved Donald Trump and he, how much he, Nancy wasn't good, nice to Donald Trump, and that's why he had to come for her. And so it's really hard to, for anyone living in public life right now, the threat has gone, I mean, the, the Secret Service, the Capitol Police people could tell you that the threats have gotten insane for anyone. So you have to ask anyone that wants to go into public life, this is what you're signing up for. It's the, 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 the danger of it is so real. And um, so thank you for asking my father. Uh, he has headaches and he uh, is not well. And it, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's not just like you wake up one day after um, being centimeters from death and that everything's just gonna, you're gonna live happily ever after. I mean, he's 84 and it was a really traumatic experience. It was very traumatic for the family. and you know everything that happened after that, which is really interesting, because I just got Steve Brill's book, and he writes about this. You know what happened after the attack. Goes back to, so this terrible thing happens in real life, and then there's some fake online news thing that said it was a male prostitute, and it was a gay sex thing gone wrong, and then, Elon Musk retweets it, and then it ends up, you get calls from the Associated Press asking, oh, well, did you know the man? And you're saying, how on earth did this get to the mainstream press? And it's on the front page of the New York Times as a legitimate story about the spread of conspiracy theories. But in talking about the spread of the conspiracy theories, you're repeating the entire conspiracy theory so that I live in a liberal bubble called Manhattan, and people walk up to me on the street, and they're like, so how did your dad know that man? And I'm like, mm. you are... A, I'm supposed to be an educated individual, and you're supposed to know. So to me, everything that happened to him is one part of the picture. The other part is the fact that, you know, my teenage sons get asked by people like, oh, is your grandfather gay and had an affair? And you're thinking, how did we get here? And how come it wasn't corrected? And there is a lot of, you know, mainstream papers that reprinted the conspiracy Clickbait, clickbait, we're horny for that clickbait, and re-spread it. Again, the streaker. And I'm like, why do we have to reprint totally both? And this is a crime that has been gone through a state and federal court. I don't understand how they can keep spreading those things online. And uh, so it's a very it's frustrating. This conversation gets really frustrating for me. So why do you choose to lean in? Because again, no one would blame you for just... We don't have a choice. This is... Okay, one thing that I think we haven't said is when you asked about who these people are, it's very... I think another thing besides just saying they're broken is that they were sold a bill of goods called the American Dream. The American Dream, I'm sorry, may still exist for immigrants that come to... The, but for the people that live in real America, the people that go to Trump rallies that I talk to every weekend... Those people feel like their life is not going to be better than their parents. And I just and want to note angry. for audio purposes that when you said real America, you used quotes there. Correct. Yeah. Um, so they are angry and because 
the political reality or the economic reality that they live in. So for that reason, I would say, we have to have a conversation. We've had a lot of conversations about how the economy is doing so well. I've been to panels where they talk about how well the economy is doing. Well, maybe for Wall Street, but not for these people. And the reason why Donald Trump may be reelected is because there's so much anger out there and we're not paying attention to it. We're just kind of saying they're all in a cult and they're all crazy and we dismiss them as being brainwashed or uneducated, but they're not all you know, bad people. They're just... They're, they're angry, and we have to address the anger in America, and I feel that's the one thing that, well, I go, this is right, what I've been doing is I've been doing these things like swing state sleepovers. I go to a Trump rally, and there's someone who's on stage with Trump, and then I go home with them, and I spend time with them, and I try to get to know them and understand them, and then I leave friends. That's in theory what I do. And they're so angry, and I think, why aren't more people going and talking to these people, and not just taking their racist, homophobic, sexist quotes, and circulating them for clicks, why aren't people actually talking to them? I don't know if any of you have ever been to Iowa like during the caucus. You see all the reporters sitting in the five-star hotel drinking at the bar. And like, why don't you go out and talk to some actual Trump supporters and try and understand them instead of just caricature them into little cartoon characters where we're all kind of laughing at them because I'm scared to death about the upcoming election. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid nobody's out there really getting, to, you see a lot of comedy crews out there getting jokes, you know, talking to Trump supporters in line and making fun of them, and those things go viral, and it's all in Comedy Central. Or, but you don't see a lot of hardcore, you know, engagement, like investigative journalists and people out there writing really long form pieces about the death of the American dream. Mitty, I want to come to you um, on this next question. And just a quick note, we'll have a few minutes for q and I'm at the end of this discussion. What I'm, it, it's not a word you used, Alexandra, but it's what I'm hearing, and that's the word empathy, that we need to extend more empathy. Think well, Lincoln, charity towards all, malice towards none. Okay, but the point of friction there is that in this country, historically, Empathy has not been right. shared equally. So you can, you can talk to any marginalized group and they will say to you, when exactly was there a high degree of empathy extended to us? When did people come to us and ask us about our anger and our feelings of being locked out of the American dream? I know there's no easy answer, but if, if the answer to this issue is empathy, is that not an empathy that has to flow in multiple directions? Oh, it absolutely has to flow in multiple directions. Um, there are communities who have felt angry, marginalized communities who have felt angry for decades, for centuries, as a result of the history of oppression and the history of slavery in America. I mean, this is, and, and why have we not seen a mass violent movement coming from communities that have been marginalized, right? And we're suddenly looking at this community and saying, well, their anger is valid, right? And we need to engage them. So I, I, I completely, I take that question and it's, it's absolutely the case that empathy needs to flow across society and particularly so to marginalized communities. The way I am looking at it is, I'm looking at this from the perspective of a national security threat. We actually have a domestic terrorism threat in the United States. Domestic terrorism poses the greatest threat to the homeland today. That has been consistently said by Christopher Wray, the director of the FBI. And, and we, we're in a moment where we can't afford to believe that anyone is too far gone. Because if people are too far gone, we are destined for a violent future. I am an optimist, and maybe that's a coping mechanism because of the work I do, but it's not, it's not a hope and a dream that we can actually meet someone who is considering and planning violence, and before they cross that line, bring them back. That's not a hope and a dream. I have, over the last 15 years of my career in counterterrorism, not only witnessed that change, so I've witnessed that change from people who were neo-Nazis, who had swastikas tattooed on their bodies and had carried out racial violence, who today are now peace activists, but also in the work that we're doing. So we are having those conversations with people that are inciting violence online, and they are willing to talk. I always reflect on, so there was recent data that was released by the Secret Service on perpetrators of mass violence in the United States. And approximately or over 80% of perpetrators of mass violence in America 
leaked their plans at some point in time in advance, and the vast majority of those individuals leaked their plans online. I see anyone leaking their plans as a cry for help. That is someone reaching out, desperately hoping someone will stop them. And again, that's not just, a, that's not just an anecdote or an assumption. There are perpetrators of mass violence who have said with deep regret, I wish someone had stopped me. So we want to ensure, and when, I, when I'm talking about empathy with this community, I am talking about that individual who is so broken that they believe that violence is the only path forward, violence either against themselves or against others. And we want to go in and not shame them, not ridicule them, but actually say, there is another way. There is another path forward. You mean something in this world, and you deserve better than the violence that you're about to perpetrate, and actually work with those individuals to change their paths. Well, that takes us to Q&A. If you have a question, and I figured there'd be lots, uh, there's a mic circulating. Let's start right here in the back. Hi, um, thank you so much, this is fascinating. Um, I'm wondering about <clears throat> if there's a role that schools can play in kind of almost a curriculum of how to teach people at a young age to not fall for these misinformation traps, radicalization, um, you know, I don't wanna say boomers are too far gone, no offense to the boomers, but how do we sort of get in there at a young age and, and take action sooner? I know there are some schools that have media literacy yep curriculum doing just that. The other argument I'd make, Vidya, is that we need robust civic education. Absolutely, yeah. So that we understand our role, responsibilities, and rights as citizens, and people feel more empowered, but I'd love to hear from you. No, that's absolutely right. Education is so critical as part of the solution here. It is much harder to get someone out when they are way far down that path than it is to give them all the skills and build that resilience when they're young and before they even encounter this sort of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's both about civic education, media literacy, and, and the approach that we've taken, and, and this is actually where, uh, you know what, when I, when I started Moonshot, I thought, I considered us to be doing work to reach those, those fringe communities online, maybe the thousands of individuals that were buying into this. But as we've already discussed, these conspiracy theories are on network television, right? So we found ourselves in the position where we were running mass uh, outreach programs to try and build those sorts of skills in the wider population to be able to confront conspiracy theories and know what they are. And what we found is, it's exactly the same as having a conversation with someone who's so far down that path. Telling people what the facts are as a way of countering is never gonna work, even if you're in that really, really upstream early prevention work. And so what we've done is tapped into the universal desire not to be manipulated. And actually, I'm struck, I'm thinking about the clip that we just showed where, um, you, know, where you, you said, are, are you not a normie? Are you not being, you know, you've been manipulated? And, and he was so defensive and didn't want to see himself as someone who has been manipulated. Nobody wants to be manipulated, right? And that once you realize you have been manipulated, there's a whole set of feelings of shame associated with that. And so we've tapped into that universal desire not to be manipulated and looked at the common tactics that are used to manipulate people online. And when you distill this down, there's a whole set of tactics that get used to that get used in almost any conspiracy theory. So things like whataboutism, you know, changing the topic on someone on a short on, on, on a moment's notice, decontextualization, like completely taking something out of its original original context, fear-mongering and scapegoating. So there's a whole range of common tactics that get used to mislead audiences. And what we found works is to go into to audiences early, whether it's in schools or whether it's adult populations, and equip them with the skills that they need to be able to spot those attempts to manipulate them online. I wonder also, to that point, whether this is a place where we need more mental health resources in schools, because a lot of what you talked about, the people who are working Absolutely. to de-escalate people, you're talking about social workers and, and Absolutely. therapists. Absolutely. And imagine this. So imagine you are buying into the conspiracy theory I mentioned before, the Great Replacement Theory. Imagine you genuinely believe that people that look like us, Jen, are, are part of this mass conspiracy theory to, to um, replace the white society. That would be a deeply terrifying prospect if it were true, and we all know it's not true. So imagine if you're buying into that, the state of fear and anxiety that you might be experiencing. Well, you know, we have to consider if we're gonna actually get people out of this, we need to actually be dealing with the mental state that someone might be in when they're very far down this path. 
And one thing I will just say, some, some data from, uh, from 2021. So we were running crisis campaigns during the insurrection. We actually had campaigns that were live through the election. We were trying to reach people who were um, pushing violent uh, election-related conspiracy theories or QAnon conspiracy theories. And it was actually on January 5th that I got a call from a member of my team saying, there's something happening in the DMV area. There's an, a dramatic escalation of uh, conspiracy theories and threats of violence in the DMV area. We need to surge. And so we surged our, our um, crisis campaigns. We were offering crisis counseling to people that were consuming that content online. When I look at the results, we take, we, if I take a subset of 200 individuals that ended up actually taking up that chance to speak to a crisis counselor, these were people consuming QAnon content, election conspiracy theory content. Of that 200, five required immediate suicide de-escalation from our counselors. An additional five required what we call active rescue, which is where the counselor had to engage local emergency services because they believed a life was at risk. That is 10 individuals out of 200 that required immediate violence de-escalation. When we compare that to the general population, if you offer crisis counseling to the general population, this is three times the amount, the, the, um, the likelihood of needing immediate violence de-escalation as compared to the general population. So what that tells us is if you are buying into these worldviews, if you are consuming this content day in, day out, you are at heightened risk of violence, whether against others or against yourself. And so those mental access to mental health resources is so critical. Let's try to get to a couple of other questions right here. Vidya, I so admire what you're doing. It's extraordinary, and I thank you. I had a personal situation, obviously not a terrorist, and obviously um, I didn't handle in the way that you recommend. My best friend of 40 years was a Trumper, and I tried to have the facts discussion many times, and then I said, I'm going to give the presidency three months and then see what she says. And she said, I said, what do you think? She said, he's a great president. His values are my values. And then I said, I can't be friends with you anymore because you don't have any values, or at least ones I agree with. Is there any way I should have done that better? Now I find out she was anti-immigrant and unconsciously anti-Semitic, and I'm Jewish, and I had tried to deal with that. Yeah. But what's the answer? Yeah, look, it's, it's not your responsibility to change the people in your life. It's not your <laughs> responsibility. And, and no, 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 a few things. One is... I also have debated the facts with people in my life. Who, so I, too, have done the very thing that I said don't do. It's, it's just natural to us, right? Where if you're a logical, well-educated person, that's what you turn to. So don't blame yourself for immediately turning to that. I've done that myself. But also, it's so important to remember, it is not your responsibility to change the people in, in your life, as painful as that will be. And it means sometimes you need to step away. So, and you need to protect yourself. You need to protect your own mental health, your own well-being, the things that make you happy in life. So yeah, I can't emphasize that enough. It is not your responsibility to change that person, and as, as painful as it might be. Um, and the one thing, I, I forgot to mention this earlier when I was um, giving that example of what to do with your uncle who's buying into conspiracy theories. Um, you know, everything I said still stands, but the one thing I would want to make absolutely clear is if the person in your life is actually threatening violence mm -hmm. against others or against yourself, that is the moment where it is so critical to seek help. Um, and I realize seeking help can take different forms. Um, if someone is threatening violence, there are some people for whom it might seem completely natural and okay to call law enforcement. For a lot of people, that's not gonna feel okay um, for multiple reasons. One is people don't wanna send their loved one away. They don't want the police to just knock down their door and, and take them away. But also, if you come from a marginalized community, there isn't that trust there with law enforcement that you think the right thing is gonna be done. So if you're not ready to call law enforcement, there are a number of organizations in the US that I can recommend that you can reach out to. There's organizations like Life After Hate, which is an organization that supports people exiting hate movements and also supports their families. There's Parents for Peace, which supports families that are coping with a loved one. Um, so there's lots of resources available to reach out to, so you don't have to deal with that alone. I feel like we could spend another hour taking questions, but we're almost out of time. Um, I know you all will be here after the panel, so maybe try to catch up with Vidya and Alexandra. But I'd like to wrap these panels, not with a big picture answer from our panelists, but with a question you want us to ask ourselves as we're leaving and as we go back to our, our communities and our homes. Alexandra? A question? A question you want us to consider. A question. I, was, I didn't have anything prepared. I would just say, get out of your liberal bubble. How do I say that in a question? 
I think it's really Are you important in a bubble? <laughs> for people to, you know, we all think that we are right and that our worldview is, I mean, I was indoctrinated into a political cult at an early age, and I'm right. I've lived in San Francisco, New York. That's my life experience, so I'm right. But what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong about everything? So I guess my question is, what if you're wrong? What if everything you believe is actually wrong? What about for you, Vidya? I also had a statement that I was trying to turn into a question. So my, the <laughs> statement that came to mind is, grant people the possibility to change and hold on to that hope. Hold on to hope. I realize the news, the topic of this panel, uh, it can really be overwhelming and leave you in a position where you just feel like there's no hope. That is not the case. There is still something we can do about this. Grant people the possibility to change. I don't know what the question version is of that, but. Can you consider that there's a possibility for there change? There we go. There we go. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Well, thanks to you. I just want to quickly mention you can find Alexandra's documentary on HBO Max. Alexandra, Vidya, thank you thank so much. You. Thank thanks, you. Jen. Okay.